We're going to pray, you guys. We are in the book of Romans, and it's been a, an amazing book to me. Uh, just reading through chapter 1 all the way to chapter 5 now, we come to chapter 6, dying to live. That's an incredible topic because we're always living, but we're not dying to what God calls us to do. So I'm going to pray. Father, we come before you to thank you so much for your grace, your love, your mercies. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be with us, Lord, and that you would be with your people that are watching, listening, that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction to all of us, but also that we can grow spiritually, Lord God, that you would feed our spirits. We want to grow. I pray for my wife. I pray for my kids, my grandkids. I pray for the staff. Lord, I pray for those from all over the world that watch and listen, Lord God, that you would speak to them, Lord, and continue to be our Lord and our Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 6, from verses 1 to 23 this evening. You know, in chapter 6 through 8, Paul defends his doctrine that he's writing. Justification by faith. Very important doctrine. You know, we're not under the law, but we're under grace, unmerited favor that God has given to us. The law condemned me, grace gives me life and gives me this unmerited favor that I don't really know about until I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. And here in Romans chapter 6, Paul says to look not only to ourselves, he says who we are but also to look at the gospel that tells us about sin. Sin that destroyed you, sin that destroyed my life, that we need to not only understand, but we need to learn how to get rid of that. And Paul's going to tell us how to do that. You know, again, in chapter 6 now, Paul gives us three instructions. Three, for attaining victory over sin. I, I guess that's always hard. How can we... How can we have victory over sin when sin is ever, ever before us, all over us, you know? You look at people in the world, they're always sinning. You know, I I get tempted as a child of God to sin, but God always reminds me through his Holy Spirit that I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, that I have been born again of the Holy Spirit. That what I'm doing now is not really me, but God is working in my life and through my life as I submit my life to him. The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, know your hearts. So our hearts are wicked. But what's so awesome is when we come to Jesus Christ, that this gospel, or actually this book of Romans, is going to tell us how we live our lives and have victory over sin. I love that. So now we're going to start in chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, and we're going to study how we are dead to sin. So Paul starts with a question. You know, questions are very important, but also a question is important, but the answer is more important, because you have to tell people the truth. So Paul starts by saying this, what shall we say then? Good question. What can I tell the body of Christ concerning sin? He says, how we continue in sin that grace may abound. You know, speaking of sin, the believer has to not only understand that we are under sin. We were born in sin, and notice, and we continue to sin until Jesus comes again. But as a child of God, God has given me the power to overcome sin. And I like what he says next. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace, grace, unmerited favor that has been given to us may abound? So what Paul said, he comes now to the answer, verse 2, certainly not. Notice what he says, certainly not. You know, if, if we sin, we experience what? More grace? No way. See, that's the mentality of a lot of people. The more I sin, the more grace God gives me. And that's not the way it works. Because the more we sin, the less we're going to have God's grace. We're going to be judged. 
But it's so awesome to know that when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ Jesus, therefore all things are passed away, but all things have become brand new. And that's what happened in my life. I knew that I was sinning. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. When I began to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, you know, God began to share with me, hey, listen, these are your sins. You need to repent. You need to come to me. I want to share my blood upon your life so that your sins can be forgiven. And how I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the blood of Jesus Christ wipes out all my sins as if I had never sinned. He takes them, he casts them as far to the east or the west. He buries them in the deepest part of the ocean and remembers them never, ever again. And here Paul blows my mind the way he says in verse 2, the answer, certainly not. There's no possible way that I can continue to sin and receive more grace from our Lord. No possible way. You know, when he speaks about we who die to sin, Notice, we who die to sin live, no, live any longer in it. it. It's impossible to live the Christian life in sin. Sin destroys your life. And yet how many people in families, friends, people you see at the grocery store, they not only live this great life of sin, and you don't have any peace when you live a life of sin. And you can see the turmoil in their lives. I mean, I I can remember, and I still remember now, but I can tell you right now that whenever I start doing something that is not right, immediately the Holy Spirit says, don't do that, because I have a will. And having a will, I I make choices. And when I make a choice, I either make a choice that is going to be a blessing or is going to bring peace in my life, or God is going to get the credit or... I'm going to bring shame to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And surely we don't want to do that. And so Paul here giving the answer, we who die to sin, we died. No longer living a life of sin. Notice again, who die to sin live live any longer in it. So we have been born again by the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, if any man is born again of the Holy Spirit, it's a new life. And Nicodemus came by night, this Pharisee, probably one of the 72 of the Sanhedrin. And he came by night as he snuck out so nobody could recognize him, nobody could know him. So when he came to Jesus, he had an important question. Jesus, you took up all these things. You know, what can I do to be born again? How can I have eternal life? And then Jesus comes back and again says, you must be born again of the Holy Spirit. The flesh is flesh, but the spirit is spirit. And and I love that because when God came to my life, when Jesus came and convicted me, when I was watching that TV program with Chuck, man, immediately, I don't know how it happens, but immediately I felt this conviction in my heart that something had happened in my life. Putting down that rifle, getting convicted, weeping, crying, asking by faith, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. And then all of a sudden, when I was forgiven, the next morning, going to get a Bible, the grace of God began to be manifested in my life. The grace of God, the unmerited favor of God. That not only I have a new life now, but I am free from sin. Free from sin. God has forgiven me. Verse 3, he says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, this is what baptism represents here. It's literally what dying to self, dying to sin. Now, I can remember as a Catholic family when my mom and my dad baptized me as a little boy. You know, I had just been born, and the priest took me, held me in his hands. They took water, poured on my forehead, and ran back to my head. You know, that the Catholic Church would say, well, now you have been, what, born again. Now you're a Christian. Now you have eternal life. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Paul is saying here. Do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, how? By being born again of the Holy Spirit, were baptized unto his death. Unto his death. 
So when I go into the water now as a Christian, not being sprinkled, but being taken and underneath the water all the way down, being held for one hour there. No, just kidding. <laughs> because one hour, you know, you'll be in heaven. But when I was taken down and I was brought up, first of all, when I went down, I went down into the grave, being buried with Christ, and then all of a sudden coming out of the water with newness of life. Imagine that. As a Christian, as a born again born again child of God. Jesus becoming my Lord, becoming my Savior. And, and looking at the scripture here, you know, we, I'm identifying myself with Jesus and his death. Identifying with his death and his resurrection. It's a picture of me being buried, and after I am buried, I'm rising in Christ Jesus in newness of life. Look at verse 4. He says, therefore, because of what I just told you, he here he's confirming baptism. He says, we were buried with Jesus Christ through baptism into death. So we were buried. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Being born again of the Holy Spirit, the privilege given to us of walking in the Spirit, walking this new life. Baptism doesn't save me. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism, again, is a picture, a symbol of the grave, being buried, being raised from the dead, having a new life in Jesus Christ, which one day we're going to die. And we're going to be buried. But when we are buried, our spirit, the moment we die, gets to go to heaven, gets to go to heaven. When I am baptized here, you know, not only being born again of the Holy Spirit, the one I'm, when I am buried here, take me underneath the water and being brought up, what a beautiful picture of me becoming a Christian and now walking in the newness of life. Being born again. And then he says in verse five, he says, for if we, have been united or identified, you identified together in the likeness of his death. When people look at us and they see that we are believers, that we're living the life of Christ because we have been buried in Christ Jesus. Then what happens, he says, again, being united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Sanctification starts with what? With regeneration. And then what? Implant, implanting the spiritual life in my life as becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. Then, then, this will happen not only at the present time, but think about this. Paul the Apostle in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. That one day we're going to experience the rapture of the church. There is a generation that is not going to experience death. There's a generation the Bible speaks about. That this, this group of people, this remnant of people that have been born again of the Holy Spirit, and they've been walking a life of obedience. That Jesus Christ is going to be sounding a trumpet. And within that trumpet, wherever you are, wherever I am, all of a sudden, in a twinkle of an eye, we're going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to be with him forever. And at the second coming of Jesus Christ, we will be coming back with him as he is going to what? Judge the world. But let me retract backwards. What's going to happen once the church is taken out of here? All hell is going to break loose. All hell. The Bible says there's going to be seven years of hell. And those people that were left behind, maybe friends, maybe family, they're going to know because you've been talking to them for months or maybe years what was going to take place. And as they look around and see that you're no longer here, but you're gone. They're going to accept Christ. And the only way at that time they can accept Christ, yes, by faith, but they're going to have to deny the Antichrist and they're going to have to deny the mark of the beast in order to live on the earth, either on your forehead or in the back of your right hand. So aren't you glad 
that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that you've been baptized, being buried in Jesus Christ, resurrected in Jesus Christ, and we're here living at this present time. Look what's happening to the world right now. The thing that is happening, not just in America, but everywhere, people are dying for the coronavirus. You know, what's going to happen tomorrow, the next and next month, next year? But how awesome it is that as a child of God, I can have comfort in Christ. That Jesus loves me. And that he's not going to leave me alone. And then my first attitude for sanctification is counting, notice, counting myself, counting ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I love that. Being alive. In Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6 through 10, we have, you know, we should not serve sin. And that's a real problem with all of us, serving sin. When we say we're serving sin, say, you know, sin is ruling my life, directing my life. Because I'm supposed to be dead to sin, not alive to sin. And when I am tempted or I, I'm getting ready to sin, I got the Holy Spirit, my conscience, that tells me, if you sin, these are the consequences. But if you don't sin, man, you're going to get blessed. These are the consequences of being an obedient child of God. So he goes on in verse 6. He's going to say this. Knowing, notice we're not stupid, knowing this, that our old men, Our old men, notice what he's talking about here. The ungodly life that we sinned before we came to Christ, being under sin. He says again, knowing this, that our old man was crucified, past tense, was, not is, was crucified, the sign of what? Of death, with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Isn't that cool? We can't excuse ourselves. The word that he uses here to be done away with, it means to be destroyed, to be put out of business. Before we were ruled and controlled by sin, no longer. Because what we, the old man has been crucified with Jesus Christ. And then we have become slaves, not of sin, We died as slaves to sin, but as slaves of Jesus Christ. Now live a life of conviction as the Holy Spirit becomes my little alarm. That when I'm getting ready to sin, it's ringing and says, don't do that because there are consequences to pay. I don't want to be a slave to sin. I want to be a slave to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that's what Paul here is so awesome. In verse 6, when he speaks about past tense, he says the old man was crucified with him, Jesus. And then verse (coughs) 7, excuse me, verse 7 he says, for we who, notice, for he who has died has been freed from sin. The freedom now that we have not in sin but apart from sin. Being ruled by the Holy Spirit, not walking around, you know, in conviction, you know, or, con- or condemnation. Because Paul says in Romans 8, 1, therefore there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, we are in Christ Jesus. We're not condemned. We're set free because of Jesus Christ. You are set free because of Jesus Christ. And, you know, even though we can be here in the church together, we are together in spirit. That Jesus Christ has touched your life. He gives you an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And even though I am here and you're there, we're still the body of Christ. We're still brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I love that. That Jesus is going to continue to rule my life. He's going to to control your life. And when he comes, we're going to be together forever and ever and ever. And my prayer is this, that we would come back to the church, that this thing would blow over, and that Jesus Christ would give us the, not only the honor to know him, 
but that these people will be woken up to come to Jesus Christ and say, you know what? I need Jesus in my life. I love that. And then he goes on, verse uh, 10. He says, for, he says, for death that he died, he died unto sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. I love that. The word that he uses here, to die, in the Greek means to keep on living. To keep on living. We died in Christ Jesus, but we died to him, which means what? My spirit will continue to live forever and ever and ever in him. And then not only the resurrection life, that we are living eternal, eternal quality and everlasting in the kingdom of God. And then in, in verses 11, he says here, the reckoning of the old man, he brings it up. He says, likewise, you also reckon, reckon. And the word that I reckon here that he's talking about, he says, this is our position of faith, to be dead, but alive to God, to be dead to self. I love that. Be reckoned to Jesus Christ, alive to Jesus Christ. Have you reckoned the old man to be dead? Or are you still feeding the old man? Man, you want to make sure that you're reckoning yourself to be dead in Christ Jesus because he goes on to say this. Dead indeed to sin, but alive. Alive, notice, to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, and I put there, my Lord, my God. And today, as I'm here, and you're watching the study, we need to understand that we share Jesus' resurrection and life, according to the scriptures. That he says there, notice the word in, because the word in speaks of my position in Jesus Christ. I've repented, I accepted him by faith, and now that I'm a child of God, Christ has to live outside of me. Christ lives in me. He's in my life, he rules my life, he governs my life. And I hope that you today can have Jesus Christ in your life. Those of you teenagers that are watching, those of you that are young adults, mother, father, son, daughter, all of us together, grandpa, grandma, aunts, uncles, that if you have people in your family that don't know Christ, please pray and share your faith with them. But most important, live your faith, that they can see that you're a Christian, that they can see that something's happened in your life, that your old man has been reckoned, reckoned the old man to be dead, Notice. And then he says, fourthly here, that we should yell our bodies to God in verses 12 to 23. In verse 12, he gives a command. Therefore, he goes back to what we just talked about. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Notice what he says. Don't let sin be king in your body, in your life. That's what it did when you were not a Christian. It ruled your life. When you come to Jesus Christ, Christ has to rule my life. The Holy Spirit has to rule my life because the Holy Spirit is the one that does what convicts me of sin. And here Paul the apostle goes on again to say, therefore the command, he says, take what? Take a stand in faith. He says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Man, you know what? We need to put away our lust. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in my life. And before Jesus Christ ruled my life, man, sin ruled every single day, every single minute, every single second, every single hour. But man, when I came to Christ, what a difference it made. That Jesus, I noticed in my life things were changing. And that Jesus Christ had become my Lord, my Master, my Savior, and my God. And I pray and I hope that that's happening to you in your life, even this very evening. And those watching all over the world, wherever you are, make sure Jesus is number one in your life. Then he says in verse 13, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Notice, again, this verse is repeating itself. From it's actually the command is given in verse 12. But something I caught here again, and do not, here again, notice we have what? A will to make choices. And do not present your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but, 
Notice the word but here. But present yourselves to God as being alive. To do what? To, and to be dead in your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Notice what he's saying here. He's talking about who we are in the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. Instruments. Instruments to Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And be not conformed to this world, but be you renewed. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. What you think, what you think is what the Scripture is declaring to each one of us. What Christ has done and what I need to be doing by the power of the Holy Spirit ruling and reigning in my life. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Notice what he says. Sin will not rule over your life. For you are not under the law. The law condemn you. But he says what? But you are under the grace of God. Why? We have the choice to obey or the choice to disobey. The grace of God, that are merited grace of God given to me in my life. That rules every single day of my life. I love it. At this present time, he's ruling over my life. And then he says in verse 15, What then? The question again, what then? What shall I do? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? Heck no, no way. Certainly not. I mean, how can we say we're Christians, people watching our lives, and we can live a life of sin, and they're watching our life of sin, and we're trying to bring them to Jesus Christ? That is hypocritical. You can't do that. It will never work. What you will do instead of bringing them to Jesus Christ, you'll draw them away from Jesus Christ and you'll send them to hell because they were being convicted by the Holy Spirit. But when you say you're a Christian and they see that you're not really living the life of Christ, what's going to happen? You're going to be held responsible by Jesus Christ. And if you've done that, even this very night, repent of it. You go to those people and tell them you're sorry. Confess to them how you were not living a Christian life and how you turned them away and how you feel responsible. And pray to the Holy Spirit that when you speak to them, that God will speak to these other people as they begin to see this this drastic change in your life that they didn't see the first time, but they see it now. I love that. And then he goes on to see verse 15 again. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace of God? Certainly not. Again, Paul says, look, we want to be obedient. We want the Holy Spirit to rule over my life, that he is number one in my life. Jesus Christ is number one in my life. How about you? Is he number one in your life? He goes on. He says, verse 16, he says, don't you just, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey? I mean, you don't need interpretation on this. You don't need an exegesis. He says, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness, which one do you want? Man, I want the kingdom of God. I want to be obedient. Verse 17, but God be thanked that through you, notice through you were slaves of sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart, notice, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. The teaching of the word of God. Before Jesus Christ, we were slaves of sin. But as we begin to read the word of God, as we begin to see it, what the word of God has said to me and the conviction it brought me to, that Jesus Christ delivered me because I read the word of God. I believe in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit brings conviction as I am reading chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that I can know the full counsel of God. If you're not doing that, you need to do that. Otherwise, how can you say you understand the New Testament when you've never read the Old Testament, when the prophecies are made in the Old Testament and they are answered in the New Testament? I encourage you, read your Bible. Verse 18, in having been set free, notice what he says, we've been set free, 
From what? From sin. You became slaves to who? Of righteousness. I love that. This is what our lives should be. We have been set free from sin. We are no longer slaves of sin, but we have been set free to worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Paul says, I know you're weak. I'm weak in the flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, notice, and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, present time now, present tense, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, listen, for holiness, a holy life. Be you holy, for I am holy. He says in 1 Peter, he says that in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, we're to be holy as he is holy. To be holy is to be obedient, to be set apart, obeying God's holy word. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You see, when we were redeemed, How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. We were wiped out. Every one of our sins wiped out, cleansed, buried. He threw them far as the east or the west. He buried them in the deepest part of the ocean, and he remembers them never again. And then verse 21, what fruit, the old life now, what fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? Are you ashamed? Of the things you did in the past, man, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of the things I did in Vietnam. I am ashamed of the way I treated my wife in my past life. The way I lived my life for self, in violence, lying, cheating, stealing. All these things that I had in my life. But when Jesus Christ touched my life, I was ashamed. Lord, will you really forgive me for these things that I have done? You know what the answer was? I will. And when he said, I will, when I read John 3, 16, man, it broke me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for me, for you, so that you could have this eternal life forever and ever and ever. The love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he goes on to say, for the end of those things is death. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. The consequences, consequences of sin is eternal death. That is a life of the flesh, living a life of the flesh. When you die, you will go to hell. And after hell, you'll go to the lake of fire, according to Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15. And then also, as Christians, our lives are ruled by the Holy Spirit, and we have eternal life. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Man, I'm looking forward to that. Very soon, I'm looking forward to that. To be with Jesus, to see my mom, to see my dad, to see my grandmother, to see whoever is there of my family. And yet, the family of God, all those that I've preached to, all those that have come to know Christ because of Jesus, that already have died and in the presence of the Lord, that one day I'm going to see Chuck. I'm going to see Pastor Chuck Smith. I'm going to see Dr. Billy Graham. I'm going to have to see, you know, Dr. Redpath. All these people that I've known is going to see so awesome to say, wow, we're here now forever and ever and ever. Verse 22. But now, Notice, because of the representing, notice because of the, not only our sins, not only have been forgiven. He says, but now having been set free, our sins gone. And having become, notice, slaves of God, not of sin, not of the flesh. Having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness again. Your fruit, that you are holy as he is holy. And to the end, everlasting life. Forever and ever and ever and ever, every one of us. Eternal life. And then finally, verse 23. 
For the wages of sin is death. The price of sin, death. Eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Again, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. To you, to you, to me, to anyone watching that is a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, man, you need to repent. You need to come to Jesus Christ. You need to get on your knees and say, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm going to pray a, a prayer in a second so you can accept Christ if you really don't know him. But again, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the, the gift, better translated this way, but the free gift by his grace that has been given to me eternal life in Christ Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Father, I pray in your son's name, the name of Jesus. Lord, for those that are watching, Lord, those that are listening, that at this particular moment, whoever's out there, Lord, that doesn't know you, and if you can get on your knees or you're sitting down or maybe you might be driving, it's very dangerous to drive under the influence of the Holy Spirit, so be careful. But if you want to accept Christ, I'm going to pray this prayer and you come to accept him. Pray with me this prayer. Dear Jesus, please forgive me, Lord, for all my sins that I have committed. And Lord, wash me by your precious blood so that every one of my sins will be taken away and that I would accept you as my Lord and my Savior and that you would use my life to bring glory and honor to your powerful name, the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray also for the church, Lord God, for the body of Christ, the Lord, whatever they're going through, whatever they're facing, Lord, Lord, that you touch them, that you heal them, and how I thank you for them, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen.